Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Climate Action Webinar, Small Firm Carbon Basics, Why It's Important and How to Measure It. AIA California has developed an in-depth educational climate action webinar series to address various climate action topics, methods, and case studies that also includes zero net carbon design, mandatory continuing education. To qualify for continuing education credit, AIA California provides the learning objectives for every webinar and includes them in the PDF presentation that can be made available online. Today's program will address low carbon materials and how to measure your project's carbon budget. A few quick housekeeping reminders. Today's session is being recorded. Access to the recording will be made available on the AIA California website www.aiacalifornia.org, along with any additional resources. Today's session qualifies for 1.5 AIA HSW learning units and ZNCD MCE for those who stay on and watch live. AIA California staff will report these units for you and will send you a ZNCD certificate of completion. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for today's presenters. You can also like a question to move it to the top of the queue. Questions that are not answered in the webinar can be made available on our website. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Carmen Suero, Associate AIA, is a principal at Good Project Company, a Los Angeles-based architectural practice. Carmen brings over 20 years of expansive experience, having worked for award-winning architecture firms, local and national construction firms, boutique interior design offices, and providing client representation on multi-stakeholder projects. Carmen is Vice President of SoCal National Organization of Minority Architects, or SoCal NOMA, where she is currently leading the Latinx and Architecture Task Force and is the California State Representative for the Small Firm Exchange. And now I'll pass it off to Carmen. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Small Firm Carbon Basics, and why it's important and how to measure it. While reducing the operational carbon impacts of structures is important, focus has turned to the impacts of material choices and construction itself. The embodied carbon of a building from extraction, processing, and assembling of materials. The AIA 2030 Commitments Design Data Exchange, DDX, added reporting of embodied carbon in 2021. In this session, we will outline the basics of embodied carbon, discuss materials that have low embodied carbon or stored carbon, and introduce a range of tools for measuring your project's kilograms of CO2 emitted per meter squared. I'd now like to introduce our main speaker for today, David Arkin. David Arkin serves on AIA's 2030 Commitment Working Group and is co-chair of the Renewables Material Task Force of the Carbon Leadership for Forum Embodied Carbon Network. He is a founding okay. member and current co-director of the California Straw Building Association, CASBA. Did I get that right, David? CASBA? You can call it CASBA. CASBA, right. thank you. And has taught and lectured on the subject of sustainable design for over 25 years. David and his wife, Annie Tilt, AIA, are principals at Arkin Tilt Architects an award-winning 2030 commitment signatory firm specializing in energy and resource efficient design. Thank you all again, and here's David. All right, thank you, Carmen, for that introduction. And I need to be able to share my screen. Uh, and there it is, all right. Yeah, well, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we're gonna talk about uh, small firm carbon basics and why it's important, uh, how to measure it. Um, I'm excited to bring this to small firms. Um, currently the 2030 commitment um, has 1100 firms uh, that are signed up. And those 1100 firms represent uh, 56,000 architects. So it's the larger firms that are really embracing the 2030 commitment, reducing uh, the operating carbon in their buildings and you know, now turning attention to embodied carbon as well. 
But the AIA has over 69,000 firms and a good number of those are small and medium sized and um, you know, sole practitioners. So we are hoping that anyone who has joined us here today who is not yet a signatory will please uh, look up the 2030 commitment, uh, sign on and uh, do your best, take small steps to get to um, the current 80% reduction in our uh, carbon emissions of our buildings with a target of carbon neutral by the year 2030. Uh, worth noting is that while small firms represent only 11% of the total 2030 signatories, the 50% um, uh, of those achieving the current 80% reduction are small firms. Um, that to me says that we as small firm practitioners are more nimble and have the ability to achieve these carbon reductions um, with our projects. So I just wanna throw that out there as a challenge to everyone. Okay, let's get going. Um, let's see. I would like to close that window. Uh, well, I just don't worry, worry about it. Um, so we have a um, imperative as an industry to uh, phase out carbon from our buildings. And uh, the 23 architecture 2030 led by gold medal award winner um, Ed Masria have mapped out paths and uh, you can see with these three paths, we increase our uh, ability to hit these targets by making faster reductions sooner. So uh, this is the, what's inspiring the program. Um, California has adopted similar aggressive uh, and, and actually more aggressive um, targets uh, with our ability to get to uh, these uh, reductions uh, a lot faster. And we are, of course, a, a leader in the nation when it comes to these carbon reductions and uh, greening our uh, electricity uh, production network, et cetera. So, um, you know, we have some several advantages uh, here in our state, of which we'll be discussing uh, today. And why is this important for architects? Well, buildings the operating and the construction and the processing of the, the building materials add up to roughly half of the carbon emissions. Um, as my professor uh, Dan Solomon liked to say, architects are not such passive bunnies. Um, we actually have a lot of uh, responsibility and uh, quite a bit of power when it comes to making these decisions. Um, the first side of the carbon uh, impacts of buildings is obviously the energy use. And for many decades now, we've had a, a very good focus on this. We've made incredible progress in reducing um, the, the carbon impacts of our buildings. Um, so we should be you know, proud of that work, but it's not over. Um, energy use intensity or EUI uh, is measured in kilo BTUs per square foot per year. And these are the obvious things, uh, HVAC loads, lighting, equipment and plug loads, anything that's tied to the ongoing operation of those buildings. Um, the 2030 commitment asks architects to report uh, currently the operating carbon reductions of their buildings in the design data exchange or DDX. Um, these are some of the metrics that will be coming out in this year's By the Numbers report. Um, we achieved a 50% overall reduction. Again, in 2020, we start, started targeting 80%. So for the reporting firms and the buildings we've created, which are substantial, 3.2 billion square feet is not nothing. We're not yet getting to the targets that we need to get to. Um, so, uh, you know, work to be done, but progress being made. And it's important that we track that progress. Um, we did notice a slight reduction from 2020 to 2021, uh, perhaps pandemic related, but also realizing that we are hitting some plateaus and that's where building electrification and other um, uh, details such as that are, are going to come in. Here in California, many of you are aware that we have a zero net energy 
mandate for residential projects, um, prepping for on-site renewables, if not including those, and uh, obviously reducing, increasing the energy performance. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about how our firm uh, targets zero net energy. Uh, the steps that we take, these are probably not unlike what uh, many of you do with your firms. Um, understanding uh, where you are, uh, as the real estate agents like to say, location, location, location. So what is the uh, climate and microclimate of that particular place? What is the ecosystem? What's happening around you? Where do winds and storms, where's the sun in the sky, et cetera. So gathering that information and summarizing it is one of the first steps we take. With that information, we then develop what we call climate response strategies. And Architecture 2030 has a wonderful palette, uh, 2030palette.org, where you can find uh, what potential um, passive solar strategies are appropriate for your building and climate. With that information, we then quickly study several different alternatives, uh, not with a goal of picking one, but more to identify what features both in terms of meeting the program, but also the relationship with the site and, and of course, you know, meeting these climate response uh, goals as well. Bringing that together into a final schematic design, we then uh, pursue 3D modeling. Um, these days, 3D models are often tied to our computer-aided design programs, and we can plug in various tools to study their thermal performance. Um, our firm uses one called Sapphira, which is a plug into both SketchUp and Revit. Um, and with this modeling, uh, our own personal hack, which works well for the scale of buildings we're typically doing, is to turn off the HVAC systems and just see what the building does uh, in a passive solar um, heating and cooling. What's, what's the temperature, basically, what's the comfort level, and then tweak the design uh, to improve that to the degree that we can. One of the things that DDX, uh, the Design Data Exchange, asks is, you know, have you modeled your building? Um, here in California, every building is modeled, thanks to our Title 24 energy documentation. Um, at our firm, we uh, have an outside um, entity a consultant that prepares not only our Title 24 documentation, but also sort of reviews our design and makes recommendations on its performance, um, envelope systems and details, etc. cetera. Um, but coming out of our Title 24 report is a number that is not quite uh, kilo PTUs per square foot per year, per year or our EUI, but it's close. It's a time dependent value that can then be adjusted um, to fit into the um, metric that the design data exchange asks for. Um, our firm's method of tracking our projects for reporting into the DDX is to create an internal spreadsheet. And it's a nice tool we found to track all sorts of information about our range of projects, but then have it in a single place where um, our DDX um, expert can upload it into, into the AIA's uh, database. We have each of our project managers doing the um, reporting of this um, information. Obviously we work with them uh, to try to get the numbers as accurate as possible. And uh, this is what the login looks like for the, the DDX. Um, so that's just a place where uh, that information ends up. So again, when uh, looking at the operating energy and targeting net zero, um, very straightforward strategies that um, are recommended uh, for achieving the highest performance building as possible. And uh, these days, of course, uh, targeting all electric, removing fossil fuels from your project um, is, is an imperative. Focusing next on embodied carbon, and this is that uh, third of the 50% um, uh, that uh, buildings are responsible for uh, are the uh, materials and construction impacts. And um, this is measured in embodied carbon intensity uh, which we're using the international units of kilograms of carbon dioxide emitted per meter squared. Um, so a little bit of translation if you want to get that into um, 
uh, you know, American uh, units, but uh, that's become the standard metric. And this is the um, development of the site impacts, the extraction, processing, and transportation of materials and uh, energy, energy use that's being used during construction, um, fuel, as well as electricity. So all of those together represent the embodied carbon footprints. Um, this is important because as we increase or uh, increase the efficiency and decrease the uh, operational carbon impacts of our buildings, the construction materials represent a greater and greater portion of this impact. And that impact is upfront. Before that building is being occupied, all of those impacts have been um, expended. And uh, the time dependent value of carbon is that we reduce the carbon we're emitting immediately. Um, so uh, as, as the, uh, again, as operations become less, uh, that immediate impact of embodied carbon is critical. Uh, the 2030 commitment in the year 2020 started um, uh, voluntary reporting of embodied carbon, and we've had a good number of firms that uh, reported in their first year and a greater number in the next year. Uh, the 2030 working group has targeted the year 2025 for when embodied carbon reporting will be integrated uh, as a mandatory input to the database. And we expect um, a more accurate picture of what are the impacts of the creation of shelter. Um, the range of embodied carbon reporting is um, quite uh, broad at the moment. Uh, I think there's some misunderstanding. We're inviting people to report the impacts of only certain building components and not the entire uh, life cycle impact. So there's, a, there's some honing in that needs to be done. But on average, buildings uh, have a 400 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. Uh, smaller buildings, uh, and especially wood frame residential buildings, um, bring that number down into the two to 300 uh, kilogram range. 75 has been identified as a good target for uh, what, a, what a good building might look like. Um, so those are just some numbers. Getting into carbon storing territory with our buildings is really difficult, um, but it is one way that we can begin to uh, be a climate solution um, and turn our buildings into carbon storing entities. Uh, this is just some more information from the DDX uh, by the numbers report, the range of uh, building types that we're reporting embodied carbon. Uh, at our own firm, we've set some targets. We're trying to do the calculating of embodied carbon for 50% of our projects. You'll see last year we fell a little bit short of that goal. And having uh, ideally at least one project per year that gets into carbon storing territory. And again, we're finding that is a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, but of all the firms reporting, only a very small percentage reported the uh, embodied carbon uh, over their portfolio projects. So we, we do have uh, a long way to go, um, but we like the improvements made in operations, expect it to go very quickly. All right, let's uh, turn our attention now to what some of the uh, current measuring tools uh, that are out there. And our Bay Area chapter of the Carbon Leadership Forum has uh, created a nice little um, database of what the range of these are. Uh, so we invite you to take a look at their website. And, but I'll be going through a number of these today. And I will then focus on a couple that I think are um, ideally suited to smaller firms and ones that we're also familiar with uh, here at Arkansas. All right, um, one of the uh, first and longest uh, running tools is the Athena calculator. Um, and it is uh, free. It is not specific to any uh, CAD program. And it um, covers all LCA stages, life uh, cycle analysis uh, stages of all building types. So it's a pretty broad tool that uh, gives one some pretty broad brush information. And uh, that Athena calculator um, is available online uh, still. Um, 
This entity, uh, Building Carbon Neutral, built a very simple calculator. Um, you enter the most rudimentary information about your building and it spits out a very rudimentary number. Uh, but it is a way of getting some gauge of where you're at relative to other buildings. The Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems contributed uh, their database uh, to create this particular calculator. It was the one that most of the 2030 firms reporting in body carbon happened to use, probably because it's the easiest. Um, Tally is perhaps the most widely known um, carbon calculator. This was developed by Kieran Timberler Timberlake. It is a uh, paid tool, um, but it was it's based on EPDs or environmental product declarations, and there's been a rapid growth in, uh, in those um, reports that then uh, can get very specific to building materials in your particular region and what their carbon impacts are. Uh, this covers all stages of life cycle assessment and features some um, good tools for analysis uh, at the end of the project. EC3 grew out of the Carbon Leadership Forum, and it is a uh, tool that is now being made free. Uh, Building Transparency is the entity that's, uh, that's managing it. Um, it's based on Tally, uh, BIM 360, and uh, EPDs, and it is um, you know, mostly tuned towards larger commercial projects, um, both in the construction, construction of the project and in the manufacturing of materials uh, being EPD based. Uh, some of the outputs from uh, EC3 are, are really powerful and compelling. Uh, so that's a, a great tool for a lot of the larger firms. EC3 is also available now as a plugin through CoveTool. So for any of the firms who are using uh, that particular uh, building analysis tool, know that uh, embodied carbon is available through it as well. Um, EHDD developed a tool they call EPIC, um, which is in its beta phase and being made available. It's um, early phase integrated carbon. Uh, so at the beginning of a project, when the big decisions are being made and the, uh, the greatest impact can be achieved with those decisions, um, that's a, uh, a tool that's available for that. And uh, next, um, one that we were very pleased to discover as a Vectorworks office uh, is an embodied cal carbon calculator plugin that they've created. Um, it's based on the uh, inventory of carbon and energy database or ICE database developed at the University of Bath in the UK. Um, it does cover all phases. And uh, one of the things that we're most excited about is its ability to do a uh, BIM takeoff. So for this very small project that I'm going to share, uh, one of ours, um, we were able to auto load directly from the um, BIM database into the tool. And uh, this particular example is just a very small cabin up in Alaska. Um, because of the frost depth there, we're using a helical pier foundation instead of um, concrete, and then largely a wood and cellulose-based structure. So with the um, plug-in, uh, we were able to show that the uh, helical piers had far less embodied carbon than uh, deep concrete piers would have had. Um, here it is measured uh, along with some of the other uh, materials and the output from the um, uh, Vectorworks calculator. Uh, other thing that it does um, that many of the other tools don't is uh, allow you to um, calculate the transportation impacts as well. Uh, another tool that's uh, I think well suited to small firms is the beam calculator. This is the uh, building emissions accounting for materials estimator developed by a Canadian group, the Builders for Climate Action, and our friend and colleague, uh, Chris Magwood, led that effort. Um, it is a tool that uh, similarly covers all phases of it. Um, it's looking to integrate EPDs, but it's currently a spreadsheet database um, tool. Uh, they're looking uh, to integrate 
biogenic carbon storage in buildings. And so it's one of the few tools, uh, Vectorworks being another, that currently has built into it uh, some of the materials that feature um, carbon storing largely by being plant-based. And as we get into some of the strategies, we'll, we'll go into greater detail about that. Uh, so one example of a project of ours where we use the beam estimator tool is a residential project in Colorado integrating um, a straw cell system, straw bales stacked to the interior of a two by four wood frame wall that's infilled, cavity infilled with cellulose. So straw and cell uh, combining to make an R43 uh, thermal wall system. Um, this is the output from uh, the beam estimator. And what's nifty here is that it gives you a, a, a graph that shows when you're getting into that carbon storing uh, uh, area for particular um, components uh, of your building. And you can see we were able to achieve carbon storing uh, in some of the structural elements and largely the exterior wall and uh, other framing systems. Uh, so just a look at this project under construction, largely wood frame. Uh, some of the timber used in the project was milled on site. Uh, and again, the, the straw bale stacked to the interior of that wood framing. Um, and that's uh, that project nearing completion. Um, okay, it's a good time to turn our attention now to some of the strategies for reducing embodied carbon impacts in your buildings and uh, ideally again getting uh, integrating some of the storing entities that can help offset um, those that can't be. Um, a good resource for diving into what are the impacts and what are the potentials for reducing them can be found in another tool developed by Architecture 2030 uh, along with the Carbon Leadership Forum, uh, the materials, the Carbon Smart Materials Palette, uh, and there's the URL for that, materialspalette.org. And within it, it uh, goes into detail on uh, what are some of the higher emitting uh, materials and what uh, your options are for reducing these. And um, thanks to uh, Marin County leading the way, there are a lot of uh, jurisdictions that are writing in a low carbon concrete mandate to their building uh, codes. And we expect that uh, this will make its way into some of the bigger codes. I think the state of California and Washington have a buy low carbon um, mandate for state buildings. So this is coming on strong. What's really great news is a lot of the concrete suppliers are on board with reducing the impacts both through additives like carbon cure and um, substituting concrete for uh, or, uh, fly ash and other uh, pozzolans for Portland cement. Um, another tool that we found in our projects is if we can specify a longer cure time, uh, 56 or 96 days rather than the typical 28 days before that concrete is put into service, uh, you can further reduce the amount of Portland cement. Uh, some of the other concretes that aren't necessarily traditional Portland cement concrete uh, that should be considered include rammed earth, um, which is, you know, can be stabilized here in California and utilized. Um, Pizze was a sprayed variation of this developed by uh, the late David Easton, um, spraying the mix of um, soil, sand, and uh, a small part of Portland cement. Uh, and a one-sided formwork to reduce the, uh, the cost of that material. A further development from rammed earthworks are earth masonry units. Um, Crown Hill Materials in Vallejo is currently supplying these, calling them their Ecoterra block. Uh, this is a project of ours um, utilizing what was then known as watershed block. Uh, we're now utilizing these as well in low carbon footings. And um, you'll see here that this is on a um, compacted uh, gravel, crushed gravel um, footing. And that has, uh, breaking news, just been adopted um, into the International Building Code uh, as a means of reducing the cement, the concrete uh, required in footings. So look for that in the next code cycle. 
Um, we've taken to using a uh, reinforced clay, micro reinforced clay floor slab in lieu of concrete slabs where we don't need those slabs to do anything other than sit on the ground. And so this is a, a form of adobe um, that's being used for, for floors um, rather than a, a Portland cement concrete slab. In this case, being placed over a uh, solar sand bed where heat is being stored and released uh, beneath that clay slab. Um, steel is another one of the um, heavier impact um, materials, but um, once again, this industry is seeing that it needs to provide a lower embodied carbon version of itself. Most American steel is both made from recycled content and uses electric arc uh, melting technology rather than fossil fuel based. Uh, so look for products that um, feature that low embodied carbon footprint. Again, an environmental product declaration or EPD uh, can help steer you towards those options. For one of our projects, we did a quick study just to see what the comparison would be between steel trusses uh, versus a hybrid wood and steel version of those. And um, we found a substantial reduction um, largely by not having as much steel. And uh, the clients chose it probably as much for the aesthetics as for the lower carbon impact. But by presenting that information, uh, it did help them to make that decision towards that uh, solution. The carbon smart materials palette also features a lot of the lower carbon or carbon storing materials. Uh, these are a few of those that are featured on that website. And um, by and large, these tend to be plant-based materials. Um, photosynthesis is the uh, function by which plants are able to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, release that oxygen, and store the carbon in the stalk of the plants. Uh, worth noting is that a good portion of that carbon also goes back into the soil, and the soil is one, and the soil is one of the uh, Earth's five natural carbon sinks. Um, so through regenerative agriculture, um, we can actually um, double the amount of carbon that we're able to store. Uh, there are a lot of carbon storing materials out there. We're gonna talk about a few of these. Um, what's great about these materials that the, is that they tend to be healthier and safer uh, and have a lot of natural um, fire resistance and other properties that uh, we look for in a lot of the manufactured building materials. There is enough grain straw grown worldwide to offset all of the transportation emissions, uh, which means that there's enough to offset those uh, carbon emitting materials uh, emissions. So we do have through the combined use of um, carbon storing and low carbon emitting materials to get our buildings to become the Earth's sixth carbon sink. Um, just to talk about a few of these, uh, bamboo has a lot of potential. This is an example of a beautiful work of a Colombian architect uh, employing timber bamboo in a truss system, uh, a unique way of tying the nodes to um, uh, members with a bolting and uh, grouting method. Um, a Northern California company, BAMCOR, has uh, taken timber bamboo and is laminating it into a panelized system. Um, it has an interior and an exterior structural load bearing and lateral shear uh, system with no studs. Uh, so in many ways, a perfect wall in that it eliminates the thermal bridging that studs would otherwise feature. Uh, they are now taking these to, I think, five stories uh, with a type three construction rating. Uh, so that's one to look for for small and medium sized buildings. Just an example here uh, of a built project using the BAMCOR system. Hempcrete uh, utilizes the starchy center of the stalk of the hemp plant. Um, after the fiber has been decorticated, that herd is hammer milled into smaller pieces mixed with a lime binder and uh, placed into formwork, not unlike the way rammed earth is put into place, and then uh, creates an insulating substrate for a plaster finish. Uh, you can see here a, an example of a project in the UK of some scale 
that uh, employs the, the Hemp Creek system. Uh, quite a bit of uh, progress being made by the Hempitecture group uh, here in the US uh, to bring this online. Uh, light straw clay is uh, in our international residential code and um, it is in the California residential code, though not fully adopted yet by the state, uh, but it's there for guidance. And we just have our first light straw clay project under construction right now in Menlo Park. Uh, but similar to hempcrete, it's an infill. Uh, in this case, using uh, loose straw with a uh, very liquidy clay slip that covers, coats the straw and then placed into formwork, not unlike the way rammed earth is placed. Uh, to create an insulated wall as well as a substrate for plaster finish. Uh, Paula Baker Laporte, um, architect now located in Oregon, has done some beautiful work uh, with the light straw clay system in their EcoNest firm. Um, Adobe is in the building code and it has been uh, since the 1940s. Uh, Cobb is also known as monolithic adobe, and that is making its way into the building code now as well. Um, not as high an insulation value as some of the other materials we've discussed, but using, used in the right location in the proper quantity, it can build similar uh, R values with uh, quite a bit of carbon storage and very low carbon in the binder. Uh, that brings us to um, what our favorite um, plant-based material is, and that would be straw in the form of straw bale construction. Um, this is a fully adopted uh, building method in the California Residential Code. Uh, straw bale is not a new technology. It is uniquely American. So like uh, democracy and jazz, we have exported um, straw bale construction around the world, uh, but it had its humble beginnings in the Sand Hills region of Nebraska, where the soil, as the name suggests, was too sandy uh, to use the traditional pioneer building method of sod and creating a soddy home. But baling equipment had just been invented and some clever individual noted that these big fuzzy bricks could be stacked up and made into building forms. Um, the load-bearing method that's illustrated here is still known as the Nebraska style of building today. Another example um, where bales were infilled not only in the walls, but between the floors and in the roof of this project in Alabama. Many, many benefits uh, to straw building. I won't go into all of these today. Uh, we will, of course, um, highlight uh, the ability of straw to store carbon and touch on a few of the others that we think are, are um, beneficial. Uh, once again, it is in the International Residential Code and fully adopted here in California. And we expect uh, to make inroads into the full building code uh, next. But it's a referenced guide um, from the International Code Council and can be used for commercial buildings with a alternative methods and materials uh, chapter. Um, I invite you to visit the CASBA website, California Straw Building Association, where you can get a free download of that code with commentary. And uh, if you wish, order a copy of the detail book that CASBA has published. Uh, one of my favorite benefits uh, as an architect who's trying to achieve uh, passive solar buildings is the thermal mass effect of the straw bale wall system in combination with the uh, exterior and interior plaster. And through some monitoring of a building by UC Berkeley, we discovered that there's a 12 hour time lag from the transfer of heat from the exterior uh, or interior surface to the center of the straw bale wall. That's that wavy green line, which you see is in opposition to the outdoor temperatures swinging from you know, nearly 50 degrees to close to 100 for some of these days, um, but an indoor temperature that ranges well within the comfort zone, 69 to 75 degrees. Um, and that was without any air conditioning in that particular example. Uh, straw bale construction is quite fire resistant. Um, it's been tested to a two hour rating. Most exterior wall systems for type five building don't even achieve one hour. 
so it, it has been recognized as a um, high performing uh, wall system and it's been put to the test by some wildfires. Uh, this example up in Mendocino County from 2017, where the owner and a neighbor took refuge in the home, uh, watched the steel container power building uh, burn uh, after they were trapped there, but they survived uh, the night in the Strawdale home. Uh, our firm has been engaged in a number of fire rebuild projects where the owners are choosing straw bale, uh, both for its high performance uh, comfort, as well as fire resistance. Uh, this one near Santa Rosa, a victim of the Tubbs fire, and uh, just a quick view of our socially distanced COVID safe bale raising um, back when uh, the pandemic was first started. Another example of a straw bale surviving a wildfire, this one closer to Sonoma, uh, fire burned right up to the foundation of the building, uh, but it survived. And then the primary benefit uh, relative to our discussion here today is the ability of straw as a rapidly renewable material to store carbon. Um, again, uh, for every pound of straw, 1.62 pounds of CO2 are drawn out of the atmosphere. So a 2,000 square foot home stores roughly 10 tons. Compare that with wood, which has a building cycle of over 40 years or growing cycle of over 40 years and uh, has less on a per pound basis storage. Plus those trees, uh, as they are maturing, uh, tend to store more and more carbon per year. So we are not going to wood build our way out of climate change um, uh, without employing some of these other biogenic resources. The combination of wood and straw has been taken to prefabricated building systems. Uh, here, a Canadian group, uh, the Endeavor Center, doing a uh, straw wall assembly in a flying factory. Uh, ModCell is a UK group that employs a similar system, timber frame, straw infill, uh, panelized, delivered to the site and craned into place uh, and done some sizable buildings. Uh, Eco Cocoon is a Slovakian company that uh, has developed a system for compressing straw into a wood frame and then cutting the surface so that you have a very uniform um, CNC uh, building module. Uh, we're actually embarking on our first eco cocoon project and I'm aware of at least two of these that have been constructed now in North America with uh, a hope that they will bring this technology uh, here, uh, specifically to California in the next few years. So we're trying to find more examples of those to inspire the market. Wood is a plant-based building material and uh, often a, a, the better um, choice uh, for structural elements. Um, and when using it, we always specify FSC or salvaged resources for our projects. Um, the uh, difficult thing with wood and forestry is it's, uh, it all looks the same, whether it comes from a clear cut or from a sustainably managed forest. So really understanding what are the sources and the forestry practices being employed um, uh, when you specify lumber. That again comes back to the power that uh, we have as architects controlling that specification uh, to get the right materials into our projects. Um, Salvaged wood is a resource that's finally being recognized for the value that it has, not only in not um, cutting down fresh timber, but often is of a higher quality uh, than the trees that are being harvested today. So uh, keep an eye out for those. Uh, this is just a quick example where we were able to use a wood truss to span a portion of a building over an arroyo in an instance where steel or concrete might have otherwise typically been used. Uh, so a hybrid of uh, steel tension rods and timber framing uh, to create a spanning element there. Um, timber is being taken to new heights. Uh, this was <laughs> one of the taller buildings ever built with wood, a nine-story tower. There's now a 21 story tower being built in Milwaukee. Uh, so tall timber is um, uh, coming on the scene. That's often 
combined with cross laminated timber, which is using larger um, members, not unlike plywood, laminating them in alternating directions. Uh, and uh, this is a good use for a lot of lumber that is of a lower grade, but uh, can help to work together with higher grade lumber to create a, a structural panel, both for floor and for wall systems. Um, and coming online soon will be the lamination of uh, bamboo as a uh, alternate to mass timber, what they call mass timber bamboo. Uh, and this is once again, a BAMCOR product that's coming online. Perhaps the best opportunity that we have is in the area of insulation products uh, and finishes. And insulation products, I'll just run through some of the examples. Uh, there is information on the Carbon Smart Materials palette of uh, what the range of options are. And you can see that for some of the higher emitting um, options, uh, extruded polystyrene in particular, uh, we can use these bio-based options and find similar uh, storage um, uh, potential in the opposite direction. I will note that the insur insulation industry, a lot of these foam-based products, they are looking at reducing the um, global warming potential emissions of their blowing agents. So know that that industry is on notice to improve uh, their impacts as well. But some of the carbon storing alternatives to consider, one you're possibly already using is uh, cellulose, uh, either sprayed or dense packed cavity fill, uh, sheep's wool. There's a group Havelock Wool out of Sparks, Nevada that makes that available. Uh, cotton and denim have been around uh, for a number of years now. Chopped straw actually meets all of the um, flame spread and smoke developed uh, requirements for uh, insulation products as an infill. Uh, rice hulls do as well. Um, and then wool is available as a loose fill product uh, as a potential. Coming online are uh, mycelium or mushroom based uh, insulation products. We have a colleague in Vermont who uses those as insulation in uh, high performance door panels, uh, but we're gonna see more and more building insulation products coming uh, online in that. And then uh, I've heard experimenting being done with um, uh, smaller uh, bio-based materials that trap uh, air, which is what insulation does, uh, in this case, a, a root mat as a potential product. Uh, for the uh, building wrap world, uh, cork is a good option. Uh, there's a compressed straw board uh, that's uh, currently available in Europe and Australia. We hope to see that one come online here in the US. Um, Dura is one name, Stromit. Uh, there are a few others um, that are uh, brand names for that. And then wood fiber board uh, is being manufactured now in Canada, as well as a group in the Northeast. And then cladding of these various natural materials, um, uh, bio-based materials is something to look for in a wide variety of uh, options that we won't go into too much detail on. There are a few other emerging uh, products and systems that are worthy of mention. Uh, stack block is a highly compressed version of straw uh, that stacks up, as you can see in the picture, much like Legos, uh, as a building system structural, uh, structurally reinforced through those cavities. Um, wood chip ICF, uh, Duracell is a version of the Fazwall system uh, with a mineral wool insulation layer, um, a good substitute for uh, foam-based uh, insulating concrete form systems. And then one that we're particularly excited about, um, Calplant One's um, Eureka MDF board, which is being manufactured from rice straw. And we had the opportunity to use this uh, product as the interior finish instead of gypsum board in one of our recent projects, a farm worker housing um, project uh, in Marin County. And uh, this uh, project also featured straw bale, uh, in this case, a system that places the bales on end between studs as an insulation system. Um, so very much paralleling standard wood frame construction, but just using straw bale instead of other insulation uh, systems. 
this is the bean calculator output for that particular project. Um, I think one of the niftiest things they do here is break it down by these building elements, and then you can really see, you know, what are the highest impact materials. Uh, interesting to find that the aluminum clad windows were the greatest emitter in this particular project. Um, durability sometimes has to be taken, well, must always be taken into account. Um, so the, the cladding on the windows and the roof, um, and then trying to balance those impacts with the uh, carbon storing elements, uh, as you see listed down below. Uh, so once again, touching on the um, Earth's uh, natural um, carbon sinks, um, atmosphere, of course, which is where it's being concentrated, the ocean, which is uh, unfortunately heating up as it uptakes more of that carbon, um, living plants, uh, soils, and then, of course, fossil fuels deep in the earth. But we posit that um, if there's anything we're going to keep doing on the planet as human beings, it's building shelter uh, for our uh, activities. And as we do this, if we can do so with carbon storing materials, buildings can indeed become the Earth's sixth carbon sink. Um, so in this last section, I'd just like to share uh, several examples. Some of these are our own projects. Some of these are uh, projects from other architects, uh, some of them from around the world, just showing that we can store carbon in buildings and uh, create highly efficient, um, low, uh, or zero net carbon energy buildings uh, and do so quite elegantly. Uh, so this is a 34,000 square foot uh, mixed use uh, warehouse office and production space in Eugene, Oregon. Um, here we just did a calculation on the walls and walls that would have emitted uh, 72,000 uh, kilograms of CH CO2 using steel studs and uh, wrap of foam insulation, fiberglass and chipboard, uh, we actually uh, achieved carbon storage uh, in the 11,000 kilogram range um, by swapping that out. Uh, so this is a view of that completed building. It does have a uh, metal cladding on the exterior that was included in that calculation. Um, just a few of the other features here, utilizing some salvaged flooring uh, from gymnasium, salvaged windows on the interior for sharing of daylight uh, through that clear story corridor, uh, offcuts from CLT uh, used as stair treads. Um, here's a peek at those bales on end between studs, um, both the uh, diagramming we did and then the ultimate installation of those. Uh, half of the clay that was used in the clay plaster on the interior finish was um, excavated on site as part of the site prep for that project. And then uh, beautiful work by the clay plaster crew led by Erica Ann Bush, uh, including a uh, little Mahonia um, painting, which is the name of the building. Uh, so that's one example of trying to take some of this straw bale to scale that we've been engaged in. Um, just a few other examples of higher performing buildings, not necessarily integrating straw bale. Uh, this is a high performance home in Palo Alto. Uh, for this particular project, we um, integrated a uh, stand of oak trees and tried to shape the building to uh, achieve massive, um, maximum passive solar performance, controlling the sun when we didn't want it in the building uh, using various shading devices, uh, but then getting it in when it was desirable and then balancing that with um, both solar thermal and photovoltaics uh, running a heat pump. Um, so just a quick view of this building. Again, probably not getting into carbon storing territory, but uh, you know, showing that you can do high performance and uh, swap in uh, cellulose and in this case uh, mineral wool wrap um, and uh, achieve lower carbon than some of the other alternatives that you might consider. Uh, another example, um, this is a small classroom building down in Carmel, um, integrating uh, some heavy timber and wood framing, um, but really focusing on 
what is a you know good environment for learning, bringing in uh, a lot of daylight, um, controlled solar gain, and natural ventilation to create uh, comfort with the minimum amount of energy use. Uh, so there's that cupola device uh, for natural ventilation and balance of daylight at the center of the building. Um, just a view of the, the space there, um, wood slat acoustic ceiling. Uh, but the real goal for this building was for it to be able to open up and connect to the outdoors. Uh, it's in an outdoor garden project. Uh, so really bringing the outdoors in. One more example of ours, this is uh, Esselin Lodge down in Big Sur, uh, renovation and expansion of their uh, existing structure from the 1940s, um, looking to minimize the amount of condition space by creating outdoor rather than indoor lobbies uh, for some of the meeting rooms, uh, protected but otherwise you know, outdoors. Uh, exposed the trusses in their um, historic dining room where they had actually had skylights installed but never um, connected them to the dining space. So finally finished that work and uh, that space is adjacent to restrooms where once again by integrating skylights just bring daylight into the otherwise center of the building. Uh, not Nothing that any of you probably aren't already employing um, the mosaic here uh, integrated some of the scraps that were found during the excavation of the construction, a fun little detail, and then creating outdoor spaces that are flexible, meeting their uh, dining numbers in inclement weather, but really encouraging folks to connect with the landscape. 93 kilowatts of photovoltaics installed here to uh, nearly completely offset the energy use uh, at the lodge facility and uh, another phase of work uh, for some of their staff housing um, at a site about a mile to the north uh, and clearly visible here integrating photovoltaics to achieve uh, zero net energy uh, for those dwelling units. Uh, just a few more examples from some other architects that illustrate their work uh, with uh, straw bale in particular and other carbon storing elements. Uh, this is a U.S. Forest Service station by WRNS down in King City. Um, beautiful uh, detailing that you can achieve with these thick walls and actually some, you know, shading uh, just by the depth of the thickness of the wall itself. This is a barrel storage room at Ridge Winery. Um, again, uh, done with uh, straw bale for insulation. And in this case, a lime plaster finish on it. A small example from the UK, but having big impact is a, uh, um, a tiny home-like uh, dwelling unit. Uh, these are not only being built on trailers, but also uh, built and then craned on the top of exist tops of existing buildings uh, to address affordable housing and through the use of chopped straw and timber uh, and other straw products uh, achieving carbon storage uh, for these little housing units. Example from Germany with unmilled lumber and straw bale uh, combined in a very elegant structure. Uh, another example from the UK, um, Moncel system uh, for a larger building there. Uh, another UK example um, using some traditional materials and uh, illustrating that these can be done uh, in very modern uh, for very modern looking buildings. So thatch uh, you know, wrought in a new way there. An example from France, panelized straw bale uh, at a fairly significant scale. Um, jumping back to the UK, another prefab building um, uh, achieving some height with uh, straw panels. So just uh, showing the, the flexibility that these materials can achieve. And finally, what I find is uh, one of the best examples thus far, a seven story housing project in France, uh, utilizing timber frame and cross laminated timber for walls and floors, and then um, putting the straw bales into fiberboard boxes and craning those into place uh, exterior of the CLT for insulation and a substrate for a cladding, a ceramic cladding system. And looking at the impacts 
the wood and the straw in the building uh, far offset uh, the smaller amounts of concrete and steel that were utilized. Finally, an example that we participated in as uh, the California Straw Building Association, Arc and Tilt, along with Arup, uh, Verdant Structural Engineers, a study funded by Stop Waste to explore what does it take to get to carbon storing and can it be achieved specifically in the East Bay. Um, so we did show that we could get into carbon storing territory utilizing a number of strategies, um, reducing the amount of concrete using low cement concrete, a uh, heavy timber buckling resistant bracing system up to the podium deck, um, some uh, earth block, CLT, um, wood, and then a straw-based um, wall panel system, a prefabricated system there, and then just looking to make better choices of carbon storing entities wherever possible. Uh, and again, it was nice to be able to show that it can be done for a medium scale, mid-size scale uh, infill building of which we are building many of. So we hope to uh, be able to bring this technology to reality sometime soon. So to uh, paraphrase Michael Pollan's food rules, if you take anything away from the presentation today, may it be this, build shelter, not too big, mostly plants. There it is boiled down into seven words. Uh, again, please, if you haven't already, become a signatory to the AIA's 2030 commitment and start reporting your projects. Uh, be part of the um, tracking of our progress at Architects towards uh, solving climate change. Here are just a few of the resources uh, that were mentioned today. I'll put this back up on the screen in a moment, and um, you're all welcome to capture screenshots of that. Um, and anything else, I'm sorry, I should have said it at the outset. Uh, in addition to uh, Sarah Vasquez, Frank Bostrom, and Bill Burke from AIA California, and our moderator today, Carmen Suero, I do want to thank a few people who contributed their work. Um, the uh, Builders for Climate Action, Architecture 2030, and my partner here at Arc and Tilt, Annie Tilt. Uh, there is information if you'd like to follow up with me for any reason, and I thank you very much for being here with us today, and I think I'm handing it back to you, Carmen. That's correct. So we will start the after party now, the Q&A. <laughs> so I, I, before we get going, I had one question just regarding your approach to the the DDX, um, which is something that for small firms can be a little daunting. Were you actually tracking all of the requirements prior to being a signatory? Uh, that's a great question. And I would say not all of all of them. Um, we certainly, you know, through our Title 24 energy documentation, you know, always focused on, okay, what, you know, percentage better than standard have we achieved here? Um, but I think with our beginning to uh, report in the DDX, we both made sure that our Title 24 um, analysis was accurate. And we then learned how to turn that time dependent value into uh, EUI for reporting into the DDX. Okay, so we have a follow up question just to clarify. So the 2030 uh, challenge, I guess, AIA. Um, do you want to talk yes. a little bit about the background to that and, and what it's meant to your practice? Sure. Um, well, uh, kind of pursuant to your original question, we became aware of the efforts of Architecture 2030, you know, Ed Masria, Vince Martinez, Aaron McDade, and others on their team, probably in the early 2000s. And so we um, made that commitment. It was very exciting to see the AIA in, I want to say 2012, 2013, adopting those goals in the form of the AIA's 2030 challenge. And then um, again, a lot of the larger firms realizing that uh, they could have a big impact um, by targeting improved 
uh, performance, reducing the carbon impacts of the building operations, and now the embodied carbon as well. Um, I joined the 2030 Working Group two years ago. Um, it uh, ha publishes annually uh, the By the Numbers report, uh, just tracking our progress. And again, I think the, 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 the most important thing beyond encouraging firms to do better is to also be able to measure how we're doing. And we're not going to get better if we don't measure it. Uh, that's a common metric in all of business. Um, so it's one that uh, AIA has adopted uh, and has made part of the, um, the framework for design excellence uh, as well. And uh, earlier this summer, I participated in a summit that was both climate action and equity social justice. Um, it was really neat to see the AIA bringing together those two priorities. Because uh, they they go hand in hand, and you know a lot of populations are going to be uh, adversely impacted by climate change. How do we design for resilience as well as uh, try to reduce the impacts of our buildings as soon as possible? Great. Okay, so we'll go to our first question from the Q and A, which is: How are these new measures for zero net energy to be implemented in the upcoming 2022 Cal Green Building Code? or more building code revision cycles? Oof. Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I'm hoping that uh, maybe you do, Carmen, or, <laughs> or Bill Burke, who's on the call with us, uh, on the line with us. Um, otherwise, I, I, I don't know specifically how these are gonna play out in Cal Green. Um, but again, you know, California is a leader and I would expect that we will start to uh, embrace these goals. So perhaps that's a little homework to us to see what additional information we can learn about that topic moving forward. All right, so maybe this one will be an easier one. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the low carbon footing that you spoke of earlier? Yes, uh, sure. So. Um, Often um, geotechnical reports specify how deep our perimeter footings need to be when perimeter footings are allowed and piers aren't required. Um, though there is an alternate solution there. Um, but for one project, we were required to have a two foot deep um, peer, uh, perimeter footing and we were able to substitute what would have normally been concrete in the lower foot with um, compacted gravel. And uh, again, this is now making its way into the building code. So it was a simple, instead of pouring concrete to the full depth, we're going to first fill it halfway with um, gravel, compact it, and then pour on top of it. Uh, similarly, in sites with bad soils, we have one project under construction right now, which is subject to liquefaction and 40 foot deep concrete piers would be the normal solution there. Uh, but we're using a rammed aggregate pier system instead. So as those piers are drilled, they're filled instead of with um, you know low strength concrete, they're being filled with um, aggregate that's being compacted. Uh, so just a couple examples of how, how that's coming online. And again, the goal is to use less Portland cement. Worldwide, Portland cement manufacturing accounts for 8% of our global emissions. Um, so it's a big opportunity uh, to reduce these carbon impacts. Great. So for the next one, I'm actually going to ask uh, Bill to join us because this one might have more than one response. Um, love to hear what you both have to say. So um, someone has a PG&E Energy Star home with cellulose insulation that has become essentially an ant farm, and they want to know how you would be handling the vermin with a hemp clay fill. So what are your takes on, on that? Well, I know that um, in uh, straw bale construction, we specifically build with straw and not hay. Um, so there's no food content. There's nothing of interest. Um, I don't know. Um, I have not heard of an ant infestation 
uh, in straw bale construction, but I, you know, experienced it in my own East Bay home <laughs> in, you know, the walls, um, you know, just regular stud frame walls. So uh, stopping them at the base, at the foundation is, is the key there. I imagine whatever measures one would take for termites um, could have a similar uh, impact on limiting the access of ants. Um, but in terms of these natural building uh, systems, you know, like any building, having it well sealed uh, keeps at least the larger uh, vermin out of it. And I would concur. I would concur, David. I mean, it's, I, I don't know. Obviously, I can't comment on this, that specific building, but it, it does seem like it's a detailing issue, um, you know, to sort of basically keep insects from getting into the wall. I'm not aware of cellulose um, being a particularly good food for ants. So I'm just wondering, I mean, I've not really heard of cell ant infestations in cellulose insulated walls. So it, my first question would be, is there something else going on um, are the ants basically just coming through the wall to get to some other food? Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not aware of cellulose having inherently having an ant problem. And so again, I think it comes back to sort of detailing of the foundation. That's my, un, you know, that's my best guess without knowing the details. Good, good, both good answers to have thoughts on. Um, so next question, um, how do estimator tools and LCA programs provide an owner with an economic cost analysis of carbon and energy solutions? Oh, excellent uh, question. I don't know that any one of those tools has built in um, something that does the um, cost impacts of these choices. I do know uh, from experience that currently many of the bio-based um, insulation products are more expensive than the traditional largely petroleum-based um, products. So you are often, you know, having to make a choice. And uh, I can give one example in our Colorado project, we were able to you know, show the carbon impacts of various insulation choices and the owner specifically said, okay, I'll pay a little bit more and we will use the cork uh, in the roof insulation package instead of you know, spray foam or um, you know, our board based foam. We, we did end up using mineral wool instead of what we, you know, some other um, insulation we'd hope to use because we were down close to grade and didn't and needed, you know, greater durability. So using what's appropriate. Um, yeah, there are other, you know, tools for calculating these trade-offs. Uh, the next step that I'd like to take with our East Bay carbon storing building example would be to um, run it by a cost estimator and see what those economic impacts are because it is an important um, metric, especially when we're targeting, you know, more affordable housing. Um, you know, when we look at the um, cost of creating a insulated wood frame wall for a typical residence to the current uh, energy codes, the straw bale wall system is starting to compare favorably uh, to be less expensive uh, when you achieve that same R value. So that's one example where I can say it's actually tilted, largely due to the uh, rising price of building materials. Um, you know, straw bales have not gone up in price, for Great. example. So in your uh, Alaska project, you mentioned that the uh, foundation, uh, you, you know, you consider the, the carbon uh, sort of background of the material when selecting your foundation. So that was an internal conversation or was the client involved in, in that one as well? Yeah, that one um, was probably as much uh, due to logistics as it was due to, um, you know, the, uh, the carbon impacts. It was just going to be easier to get those piers and the little machine that spins them into the ground 
on site than it was concrete. Um, so honest answer, carbon was a side benefit of making a choice that uh, you know had other things uh, driving it. Um, we uh, have used helical piers here in California. There's also a system of pin footing, uh, diamond footings. Um, so other non-concrete uh, and lower carbon um, options are available. Okay, so I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here that have similar uh, subject matters. Um, and it has to do with the GCs that you're working with, the contractors. Um, what phase do you start engaging contractors when you're installing these alternate insulation systems? And, and how do you find contractors that are familiar with the products? Yeah, that's a super question. I'm glad someone asked that. Um, the first thing I'll note is that the majority of our straw bale buildings have been built by builders who hadn't done it before. Um, as we like to say in CASBA, it ain't rocket science. Um, and in many ways, it's just an exterior wall system. You still have foundations and roofs and you know doors and windows and lighting and plumbing, uh, et cetera. So um, you know that that part of it. We that said, we uh, encourage our clients to engage with a potential builder in schematic design, not only to do you know early pricing, but also to just bring them on board and get a reality check with all of these things uh, that are being put on the table. Um, you know, they often have uh, great ideas of how they might want to, you know, change a detail to make it more buildable. Um, you know, we participate in the construction in the form of the bail raising, and I always learn something, you know, that we can do better the next time. Uh, so, uh, but it, we try to, you know, encourage a collaboration that ends up in a negotiated bid. Um, sometimes, you know, through um, either the mandate from the funding, uh, it has to go out for bid and be a low bid project. And we've done those, we've actually done one, you know, with straw bale and integrated that into the specifications and you know, had a builder who had never done it before did it. So, but yeah, there's some education involved for sure. And, uh, and, you know, I would say that the, the only thing uh, that I try to avoid is when a builder, you know, just says a hard no. They say, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I said, great, you're not going to build our project. Great. Um, what about your cost? What have you seen to be the biggest cost implications with the alternate insulation system? I find that it tends to be um, some of the subcontractors who aren't familiar with it, and then they're, you know, putting a premium on their services um, just to do something new that they haven't done before, um, having to put a higher price tag on it. Again, with the um, with the uh, straw bale specifically, um, we often engage the owners or the, the community that's building a structure in this um, day of placing the bales in the walls. Uh, that's either done as a volunteer day or as a workshop where people pay money to come and learn and do. Uh, so the, the cost impacts of that are, are minimized if not eliminated. Um, you know, we do note that the walls are 18 inches to two feet thick. So you're giving up, you know, you're, you're building a larger building footprint for the same amount of usable square footage on the interior. That has a cost impact. Um, however, you know, the higher insulation value, the play of light off of a deep window and door openings, et cetera, uh, I think, you know, brings value that offsets that. Thanks. So we talked a little bit about vermins inside of our walls. Um, have you had any experience with mold using products such as straw or hemp in your construction? Um, I'm happy to say we have not. Um, there have been instances where uh, buildings were exposed to liquid water in one way or another and deterioration did begin to happen. Um, however, I would quickly note that uh, nearly any other building system which is exposed to liquid water does, um, is adversely impacted. Um, at 
uh, greater than 19% moisture content sustained uh, wood will begin to dry rot. And uh, at greater than 19% moisture content sustained in a straw bale, um, compost happens. So, um, you know, it can take on moisture and then release that moisture, but if it's sustained, uh, there can be um, damage that's, uh, you know, that has to be dealt with. We did have one example, um, a contractor drilled through a protector plate and put the tip of a screw into a sprinkler pipe, which started a slow drip above a straw bale wall. And the owner noted a musty smell after several months, um, discovered you know, the leak uh, above the bale wall, took off the interior plaster, the upper bale uh, was damaged, the one below it was beginning to be damaged, fixed the leak, pulled those out, put new ones in, replastered. It's been fine ever since. That was 20 years ago. David, um, um, Carmen, do you want to go ahead? No, I was going to say, Bill, what else okay. you got for us? Uh, well, I was going to just going to say, can you speak a little bit to just some of the detailing? I mean, my take is your straw bale buildings tend to have deep overhangs to limit just, you know, bulk water from a rainstorm. Uh, and that, um, do you want to, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, vapor retarders in a straw bale wall? Um, and, and then I also noticed there are a couple of questions about lateral loading in straw bale walls. So those are a couple of different things. Do you, can you address any of those? We're just- I, I can address all of those. Okay, great. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, we, we uh, have three simple rules in bale building, um, which are good shoes, good hat, and a co coat that breathes. Um, good shoes is a foundation that has the bale separated uh, up above, you know, the, the ground plane and separated so there's no moisture transfer, you know, from the foundation up into the bales. Um, a good hat tends to be an overhang, uh, though there are other ways of creating a, um, you know, drainage plane uh, in, in the wall, um, but generally a uh, overhang that keeps all but the most wind-driven rain off the wall is advised. And then a coat that breathes is a vapor permeable finish so that if moisture vapor does get in, it's allowed to breathe out again. Uh, so the code specifically says um, that vapor um, barriers are not to be used and that a minimum uh, perm rating is to be achieved. I forget what it is offhand, but that a um, lime cement plaster that has uh, no less than one sixth lime in the mix um, is required to maintain that uh, permeability and lime plaster is a uh, uh, better finish. We also use uh, PZ, which is the sprayed version of rammed earth uh, as a finish on bale walls, but that breathability helps. The last thing to say about it is just keep them dry, um, you know, and uh, we, we have a moisture meter. We check our bales, you know, when they go, before they go in the wall, we check them when they're in the wall, check them when they're plastered, and then when necessary, you know, follow up and uh, check them. So Fascinating, and we're getting really into the details here. So I'm going to yeah. actually pull two more questions that have to do with the straw bale construction, just kind of to wrap up that conversation. The first one is, how do you deal with electrical and plumbing inside of a straw bale wall? And then the second one is, uh, what thickness of plaster are you applying on straw bale wall? Great. Um, yeah, I want to circle back to the other half of the question Bill uh, brought up, which is that of structural loading and um, uh, there have been uh, lateral and out of plate load tests that have been done and all of that, um, and those engineering requirements are specified in Appendix S, now AS, Appendix AS of the residential code. So I'd uh, direct you to, to that for those elements. For electrical, um, what, what is, um, allowed uh, is the use of non-metallic cable, otherwise known as Romex. And that can simply be tucked in the gaps between the bales 
or run along uh, posts or other you know, structural elements. Um, typically, we use a I, wood eye joist as a vertical framing member. So we'll often attach electrical boxes to those framing members and then route the um, non-metallic cable along those so they're well protected. Uh, but if you do have the need for an electrical box in the middle of a wall panel, a uh, 12 inch pointed stake, what we call a vampire stake, a two by two with a point on it can be pounded into the wall, mount a metal box on it, bring the cable to it. Uh, so that's a solution there. Um, plaster skins are a typical three coat plaster. Um, so, you know, seven eighths is the minimum, but uh, a straw bale is not flat. Uh, it tends to have, you know, some, some waving in it. So I think, you know, uh, anywhere between an inch to an inch and a half is probably the average uh, thickness of the plaster that ends up when it's a three coat hand applied system. When a, when a pise is sprayed on, it's probably two inches average, if not more. And that's a one shot application. Um, outside of the effort that it takes to do the masking because it's being sprayed on with gunite equipment, um, we find that uh, that can be a pretty economical finish. And then with the prefab systems, some of those are built with the bales, um, with, the, with the wall panel horizontal. So you can actually pour that finish on it and then tilt it up. Uh, so there's some economy to be achieved with the prefab systems. So I believe we are about to uh, be at time. We have four minutes left. So I'm going to uh, change direction a little bit and, and ask a little bit more of, of a larger picture uh, question. This will be our, our last one and then we'll wrap up. So what is next for us as we tackle um, these issues and the momentum is strong in the industry as it pertains to what is being created for future generations. What's your dream? <laughs> well, um, I, I think I've already uh, said it a few times that uh, buildings become the earth's sixth carbon sink. Um, that we begin to understand, that we not only begin, that we finally understand that everything we do um, potentially either emits or stores carbon. And that's from, you know, planting trees to driving a car to building a building. Um, so, you know, as we not only pay attention to these, but uh, measure our progress, um, we'll only get better. Uh, so, you know, um, I would like to see uh, streets that are, are either, um, you know, painted uh, white so they don't uh, absorb as much heat or covered with photovoltaic panels so they become part of an electricity grid, you know, just to throw some crazy stuff on the table. <laughs> Things I think about as I bicycle uh, back and forth to work. Great. Well, that's a, a, a great, uh, place to end the conversation for today. There are a lot of great questions still left in the chat. So uh, Sarah, as we wrap up, is there any way of addressing these um, in some sort of document and sending it back um, to all of the participants today? Um, if David is able, sometimes we can uh, uh, answer questions offline and then post them on the website. Um, and it varies on when we get responses back and when they're available on the website. But um, I can even uh, put the link to the Climate Action Webinars webpage in the chat for everyone. So that way they can kind of peek on the different webinars that we have on there and follow up and see if the questions are answered. Um, but we can try and do that offline. Great. I, I would be happy to do that. Great. I actually am excited to see what questions have been asked and look forward to answering them. Um, I will note that. Uh, we had a call earlier today with the insurance industry uh, towards making all forms of bio-based natural buildings more insurable. Uh, just kind of let that industry know that this is coming and they need to be aware of it. Um, and then, you know, one last thought on, on your last question, Carmen. You know, my other hope is that not only do uh, straw bale and jazz live on in America, but also democracy. 
I think we are honestly at a pivotal moment and, uh, you know, the future of our country and its ability to address climate change is on the line. So I encourage everyone to get involved in uh, helping make political change. Great. Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Sarah, do you, or I guess Bill, who wants to close us out for the day? I do that. Thank you guys for attending. Um, again, for those who were who've made it this far, um, AIA California staff will report the credits that you received today to AIA, um, and AIA California staff will be sending out the ZNCD certificates of completion. Um, please allow a couple weeks before you see credits posted on your transcript or certificates in your inbox. Um, these are updated and sent out manually, so time varies on when you'll receive them. If you have any questions, feel please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you guys again for being here. And thank you, Carmen and David. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Good afternoon, all. Bye-bye.